Pembroke Country Park is a place to enjoy miles of white sandy beaches, 200 hectares of woodland and attractions including a ski slope, toboggan and a closed cycle circuit. But step off the beaten track and you'll soon find a much darker side to this amazing landscape. In this vlog, I'm setting out to find the remains of Pembroke's Royal Ordnance Factory. I'll check out the fascinating shipwrecks which date back to a time when the area was a major shipping route. And I'll look at the historic and modern day use Pembroke had and still has in training military personnel. Well, Pembroke Country Park wasn't always the magnificent parkland you see today. Over 100 years ago, this site provided the ideal conditions for the dangerous job of creating explosives for wartime Britain. The huge expanse would have been full of factories making TNT and cordite during both world wars. And look a little closer and you can still find some of those remains today. Now, over 100 years ago, this site in Pembroke was the UK's biggest munitions factory during World War I. And this lead line tunnel would have been full of the explosive substance nitroglycerine. At its peak, there were over 6,000 people employed, mostly women, and many worked in terrible conditions in over 400 buildings, making 25 tonnes of cordite and 300 tonnes of dynamite a week. But if those dangerous conditions weren't bad enough, there are reports suggesting the chemicals inside turned people's skin yellow, earning the women the nickname the Canary Girls. Conditions meant women would also face nitric and sulfuric fumes that would change the colour of their hair, their eyes and break down the enamel on their teeth. The area's natural dunes helped form artificial moulds and bunkers which provided camouflage but also protection against an explosion within the factory and the surrounding buildings. Now the cordite being mixed in these enclosures went in everything from rifle bullets to heavy artillery and shells. But the work inside was so dangerous, only six people could work at any one time to minimise the risk to life. But if there was an explosion, well these tunnels and their curvature design would hopefully minimise the impact of that explosion affecting other enclosures carrying out exactly the same work. Now the process itself would happen in the centre of the enclosure, right about there, where you'd have a wooden shack where people would work. Quite a flimsy shack, so if there was an explosion, they could be rebuilt quite quickly. And you're surrounded by these giant blast banks, which would offer protection. And everywhere you look within the park, it's not hard to see just how dangerous this ordnance factory once was. Now the site itself suffered several explosions and was later bombed by the Germans during World War II and presumably it's in bunkers like this the women would take shelter. In fact, the factory had only been open a few months when seven young workers were killed in what newspapers at the time called a horrific event. Now most of what was made here left by train with the site connected to the main Paddington line. And while it's not clear, it's understood the munitions were then loaded on trains in these hidden magazine bunkers, ready to be sent to London and across the UK. However, by 1944, Pembroke began to decommission its buildings, and by 1964, the factory was later closed. The area was then handed over to the local authority, and over several years went on to become the country park we know today. But with many choosing to come and enjoy its amazing beauty, traces of the park's darker wartime history, including tunnels, magazines, and some railway system are still visible around almost every corner. However, the fascinating history doesn't end there. Now walking along this stretch of pristine Carmarthenshire Beach, it's hard to imagine there's said to be 300 shipwrecks underneath the sand of Kevin Sedan. And look a little closer and many of those wrecks are still visible with the ever-changing tide. The shifting sands determine just what people can see and when, but in recent years it's even washed up skeletons and relics of long-lost ships. Elsewhere, there's a series of wrecks over several miles, each with their own unique story and often a tragic ending for those on board. However, while work continues to try and establish the history of all the wrecks, the story behind some remains unclear. 
On a low tide, you can see the Teviotdale, which was caught in a gale on its way to Bombay in 1886 and left stranded. Of the 20 crew, 17 perished. Now the history behind this wreck, believed to be from the 1800s, isn't all that clear. Some say the wreck here due to strong winds, others say navigational error. But there's also a darker story that ships like this were lured here by false beacons on the sand dunes behind, ready to have their cargo plundered. One of the most notable wrecks is that of the SV Paul, a windjammer which would have looked very similar to this. The ship ran into severe gales in 1925, carrying timber, and after a failed attempt to refloat her, it suggested much of the cargo ended up in the hands of locals. Now, of the 200 sailors and crew that perished on the beach, most were brought here to nearby St. Isted's Church in Pembrey, and it's here you'll find the memorial to the niece of Josephine, consort to Napoleon Bonaparte. Young 12-year-old Adeline was on La Jeune MR from Martinique when the captain made a mistake in navigation and the ship ran aground in 1828. Only six of those on board survived. Finally, further up the coast, it's a mixture of old and new. This stretch often sees the RAF carry out a range of exercises, normally with military transport aircraft or on the nearby air weapons range, providing an air-to-ground bombing and strafing practice area for modern-day aircraft. However, in the mid-1930s, it was the top bombing and gunnery school in the UK, and by May 1940, the nearby airfield at RAF Pembrey became a fighter command station, and some of that important history is still around today. Well, Pembrey Trading Dome was built to help the air gunners of World War II. It's in buildings like this all across the country. They'd learn how to practice firing at their target. And this base became so important, it later joined the Battle of Britain. Its job in 1942 was to immerse the gunners in a virtual reality experience, projecting images of the aircraft onto the dome and then asking the gunner to fire at the image, with the instructor able to assess whether he hit the target. It's now a scheduled ancient monument, a Grade 2 listed building, and it's the only training dome that remains anywhere in Wales. Plans remain to restore the dome, much like this one currently at Langham in North Norfolk, which is able to take people on a unique journey back in time. But the fascinating history doesn't end there. In fact, RAF Pembrey was the home of Flying Ace Wing Commander Guy Gibson. If the name sounds familiar, he led the Dambusters Raid in 1943. And the airfield is where a German Luftwaffe pilot landed in error during World War II after mistaking the Bristol Channel for the English Channel. His unique aircraft then became the first FWI-90 to be captured by the Allies during wartime, providing the RAF with valuable insight into the enemy aircraft. A quick look beyond the boundary and there's plenty of hidden defences, including this, an observation bunker, which once defended the airfield from attack. This battle headquarters would have been the command centre with excellent views over the runway. However, nature has taken over much of the site and the remains are now pretty hard to find. There's also a series of pillboxes and concrete structures all along the West Wales coast, which would have once defended Pembrey from an attack by sea. But just walk among the miles and miles of track and forestry and there's still plenty of history just waiting to be discovered. These days, Pembrey Airfield is now run by a local self-made millionaire and it's used by private and military aircraft to refuel and often welcomes VIPs and royal visits. And despite being Wales' smallest commercial airport, the runway is in fact the same size as London City Airport. So the next time you visit this picturesque Carmarthenshire Park, take a moment just to admire the heroes of the First and Second World War and its amazing and often forgotten history.